Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon session, actually the final session of our uh, webinar on culture and jobs. Here we have um, an important uh, responsibility, that of uh, landing all the previous considerations on the analysis of uh, specific case studies to understand how this can be concretely implemented and what is actually the practice in the field at the moment. I think we have an extremely interesting uh, panel of uh, speakers for this uh, case study session. And I am uh, particularly uh, proud to introduce uh, Yann Hamilton from XPO North, uh, which is uh, a very interesting organization supporting practitioners across the creative industries in Scotland. Yann, the floor is yours. Off to a good start there, sorry. Thank you for inviting me um, to, to speak with Pierre Luigi and, and for that introduction. Um, I think it's probably a little worth spending a little time just to run through some context around what we do and why. Um, the first thing I would mention though is that I have a book at home called Great Speeches of the World and nothing that I'm about to say is in it. So you can be relieved at that. Um, HIE, Highlands Nails Enterprise, is the Economic Development Agency for the northern half of Scotland. We cover a fairly sizable patch, the size of Belgium, but with significantly less population. Um, one of the things that we found then was that for people to get together, there were some challenges. The geography just makes that, that a, little, a little difficult. The other thing I would say is that our early programmes and standard programmes as a public sector agency um, are set up um, don't always fit terribly well with the creative sector. So what we effectively did was to set up Expo North, which provided bespoke specialised support to the creative sector. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Thanks. So I'm not going to run through all of these, but there's a couple of the challenges that the businesses are facing that I would really like to, to highlight. COVID and Brexit is certainly obvious. I don't think we need to, to say much about that. But the, but the ones that probably do jump out, access to information. The, on this, at one time, gaining information was difficult. Now the difficulty is how do you sort out that information? There is so much information available. The challenge is actually working out what is going to be useful, what's going to be helpful, and fitting that into your, your busy working day. Um, I would also highlight access to new markets and networks. Again, in particular, if you're in a rural area, how do you look at, one, cutting aside enough time to go and see what other people are doing, to learn from that, and to make the approaches to new markets, particularly if, if it's a small business where your time is really spent keeping the business going, making your product. The next thing I would mention um, very quickly is scale and institutional barriers. We know that the sector is generally driven by small businesses. Certainly in our area, they're all pretty much all micro and small businesses. But the support systems are very often set up in such a way that they're looking for slightly larger scale companies to come in and companies that, um, that have more traditional growth patterns and structures and how they're working. So there were real challenges at times about how to, to, to bring those two elements together. And the last one I would mention is skills gaps. As a sector, there's always going to be challenges around skills. The sector itself moves so rapidly and small businesses just cannot have all the skills they're going to require in-house. And the pandemic has exacerbated that. There were also challenges for ourselves, though, in, in our response to these. Um, one was about how we could have the flexibility and the pace that was needed to keep up with what the, the business demands were. And also um, how to keep up with innovation ourselves, um, how to, to look at how we retain the re um, relationships with the businesses and the networks we're involved in, and also how to have long term change when most programs are set up for short term processes, short term gains and short term results. And so there are automatically some, going to be some challenges around that for us. The one thing I would say about the skills, ga um, skills gaps that are coming is that while the direction of travel um, pr prior to the pandemic was um, 
particularly around di digital adoption and some of the other elements in that, has, has not really changed. The pandemic itself has been a particularly brutal way of changing the pace of that and things having to, to speed up. So Expo North, um, as I mentioned, it's been our, um, our main response to the specialist, to specialist support. We provide year round advisory and support service, annual conference training, work opportunities, networking, and innovation support, and some sub programs I mentioned there. But I would say the most important thing that, that we do is to provide a longer term relationship with businesses that can provide support and advice when it's needed um, with an understanding of the business and what they're trying to do. And crucially, is to provide a context for people to get together and share experiences, share knowledge, and bring together complementary skills. It allows for valuable peer-to-peer -peer learning, and it allows us to really drill down into the skills required and to sense check what we're trying to do against our local, national, and international networks. The immediate skills that we've identified, um, that some, amongst them anyway, would be digital, looking at data, customer engagement, immersive experiences, storytelling, um, new ways to, or different ways to access finance, whether that's crowd economy or through commercial partnerships where um, skills around managing relationships, particularly where the partners may be very unequal in scale or skills around innovation, looking at business models as well as new products and services, and then skills for new entrants, whether that's in academia or whether it's people coming into the sector with, without that kind of background. And certainly in the longer term, it's going to be around digital skills. Our conference and networking events have been successful. Um, the conference brings in key international decision makers so we can showcase what's here, but it's also been a way that we could remove some of the, the tags that are placed on businesses. We don't want to focus so much on music or TV or publishing, but to share approaches and bring together complementary skills and knowledge. If you're a young musician, for example, it may be far more beneficial to, for you to meet a filmmaker or a games, a games developer than it would be to meet another musician, because that's bringing new knowledge and new opportunities to you that you may not get from your, your normal group of peers. It's also been a great way to, to, to show what the skills are that the creative sector offers that's valuable to other sectors, particularly in things like tourism, food and drink, digital health. And again, I think what's really important is about creating, the, through the networks, creating direct business opportunities. And we can then supply training towards those. So a couple of examples would be things like um, uh, pitching sessions for publishers to, to license new books to film and TV. And again, there was skills required around that, around pitching, but also understanding what those other se uh, sectors of creative industries were looking for. Um, we're about to kick off an another series now looking at providing music for film and television, pitching to, to live briefs and, and, and trying to create some more work that way. Um, the relationships that we have with these partners are also been really helpful because it means that we also then have the skills we need to try and deliver some of this training, whether it's things like Skills Development Scotland with Certificate of Work Readiness and in Creative Industries, or working with the Department of Work and Pensions and others for the unemployed, or academic, working with academia, not just with the students, but what the universities and colleges can offer to businesses. Um, an example of the work in this area, I think that sums this up, would be a uh, producer and songwriter and studio owner in a very rural part of the area. He has an amazing track record as a writer, um, has also a great talent um, for uh, great skills at developing new talent and getting them to market. He partnered up as a very small business, he partnered up with a global music company which meant that he got work and access to their infrastructure and was also to able to give the new talent he works with access to the infrastructure as well. But there were some challenges around that and bringing the skills that he needed. The first one was around business modeling to see how that partnership and that collaboration could actually work. And the second one was really around um, ensuring that he could manage his side of the partnership because clearly being a, a sole trader in a rural part of the Highlands means that you are going to be at some disadvantages working with a, a global company. And so again, there's these skills we needed, but also skills around resilience, looking at where his role fitted in with this, this um, relationship during the pandemic, and now how rethinking that, now that the, the company's having to restructure 
uh, because of the, the effects of COVID, COVID. So again, it's about having that relationship and being able to either introduce the skills ourselves or to find um, partners or people that he can work with to help develop those. Um, in order to, another challenge we have is about retaining young people in the area. And I think um, ensuring that they have the sector, the skills the sector will need, make them more employable um, is a really important thing for us. Can we have the next slide? Sorry, um, if we could just jump past that one, please. So, in this slide, um, what it refers to a programme we're running now with the University of the Highlands and Islands, a relationship we've started there. It, we've working with a cohort of 63 students across 17 individual creative courses. And the idea in this is that we can provide access to networks, access to work opportunities, provide information about um, what life is like in the real world, about different ways of working. And it's also been about how we can bring together the students to pool their skills and, and, and look at collaborations they can do immediately. What's been really exciting for me about this is, is a couple of things. One is that after four years of their degree, they can still with, work with Expo North. So as we see them developing their business ideas, we'll have been engaged with them for a period of time. And so I think the prospects for what we can do with them and how they can um, develop in the future are markedly enhanced. The other thing is that we're seeing a lot of the students coming now who have a very different view on what working in the creative industries might mean and that they're not seeing themselves as being purely about music or about screen or, or whatever and they're seeing themselves as more engaged in creating content and being involved in content distribution and so they have, they're looking for different ways of working which again gives some exciting prospects. An example of something that's come out of that was a, a new business that was started um, which was looking at providing music for film and television and games. Um, we managed to get the, the, the student onto a placement pro, uh, various placements. He's done a lot of work with individual with different companies and has now reached the stage where he's fairly successful in getting his own music used and also representing the other composers, the other students that are composers as well. And we're actually seeing international sales of his music and licensing. And that developed fairly quickly, but again, it was about having the ability to introduce the skills as they were required. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, another of our programmes that we, we work on is Expo North Digital, and it's largely focused on the crowd economy, on customer engagement and immersive experiences, remote participation, which if you can imagine the geography like the islands and islands is particularly useful. We provide support around technical skills, around storytelling and um, an identity and, and assigning meaning. And I think that's a really important one because at one time, assigning meaning to products and services and ideas was really the preserve of Hollywood or major labels. But the techn technology changes and the opportunities that we're seeing allow much smaller businesses to actually take charge of that themselves and really um, attach their own meaning to things. Um, also, we put a lot of time into understanding the plat platforms that are out there that you can already work with and how to maximize them. So things like Member Mouse or Patreon or Bookshop.org or Not in the High Street, really how to, to, to get more out of those. Also, how to use data and how to gather the data and where the value lies. And another one that I hadn't particularly thought of at the time, but has really come up, was around better understanding of IP. Um, with everything going online, suddenly a lot of your products and services are much more visible than they were and you're also seeing what other people are doing and we're finding there's been a lot more issues coming up around copying of stuff or um, taking ideas and reusing them and so th this idea that so people's understanding of IP and how, what they need to be doing with it has had to improve. I think a, a good example in this space would be a, a singer that we have in the area who, to give you an idea scale, has 98 million streams on Spotify alone, but her entire business was built around the live sector. We worked with her to develop a plan for really how she could better exploit the online opportunities, to better understand the data that she was getting, and then how she could more effectively engage with a, 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 what, what in fact a very motivated audience, people who really want to be involved, involved with, with her. 
and um, we drilled into the data to see what the consumers were really looking for and we're working with her now on commercial partnerships synchronization and licensing and a variety of, of opportunities online and um, what i would say is that our own digital skills were tested last year when we had less than three months to change our physical conference with around 90 speakers and 40 sessions into an online event of the same scale um, and as I said, the conference to us was really important because it was that opportunity to bring in people with skills and knowledge and get them involved in what we're doing that just sense checked what we were doing and offered greater, um, greater benefits to the businesses. Uh, come to the next slide. The final section of work that I would just briefly pick up on was is Expo North Heritage, which again is a fairly new area for us to have been working in. The idea here was about bringing museums that had great stories closer to the creative businesses um, who have act market access for products. So what we found was that the museums and the heritage sector by and large had fairly low levels of digital skills. So we spent a lot of time working with them on digital strategies around um, providing hangouts so that people could come in and have one-to-one -one discussions with specialist advisors. Um, we put on a series of webinars looking at everything from social media to developing virtual tours and things and again the demand for that was interesting we had over 40,000 views for those sessions uh, and, and built up a series of them and um, we also spent a lot of time helping them to understand the technical requirements for the content that they might be producing so for example when is a photo camera on a phone okay to do stuff what are the levels of expectation that customers will have and really developing some skills around that and at the moment, we're running a series of five webinars and workshops that are looking at the idea of the museum as an archive for creative businesses so that they can work together to develop new products and services that have real provenance and a sense of place. And again, this is about means that there are new skills required here, again, about managing relationships, but also about how to most effectively get the best out of archives and things, particularly when a lot of the business we're working with have never tried that approach. Um, a good example, I think, of work in this one was a, a West Highland Museum who took part in the Hangouts, took, a, took on board a lot of the advice, took part in the webinars and training, and have now completely shifted their business models. Um, they're offering a whole lot of on, online content, things to immersive experiences that um, their consumers can really engage with. And also importantly, focusing on the fact that this is not just about trying, trying to kill time so COVID is passed and customers come back to the door. It's about how to tap into the markets, the global markets of people who may have an interest in heritage or the Highlands or Scotland, who may never ever actually get near the building. And one of the successes with that one is that they've actually now got to the stage of um, gaining an innovation voucher to work with St. Andrews University to develop a whole load of more experiences and content. So I guess really to finish off, what would I say that has been achieved through the programme and with the skills we were looking at. I mean, we engaged with over 600 unique businesses directly last year. We've had on the webinars and um, training and workshops and things more than 80,000 views over the last, the last nine months. And, but I think probably the most important thing is we've helped businesses to, to identify the changes their business models needed for the long term, rather than something that was done as a short term basis in order to keep things moving. Thank you. Uh, maybe hand back to Pierre Luigi now. Thank you very much, Jain, and for this uh, impressively rich presentation with uh, so many interesting implications. I'll have to curb my urge to make uh, questions about uh, many of the points that you raised, but I, I will just postpone it after the next presentation. And since you mentioned Belgium at the beginning of your presentation, it comes out, uh, it's now the turn of Belgium and in particular of Hans van der Linden, policy advisor at the Department of Culture, Youth and Media of the regions of Flanders. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I pre-recorded my session. Good afternoon. I am Hans van der Linden. Well, it should should play entirely. I'm not sure if something went wrong. Good afternoon. I am Hans van der Linden, and I'm working for the Flemish government's Department for Culture, Youth and Media. 
I want to introduce you to a project we recently launched in order to stimulate digital leadership in the cultural sector. I want to start off with framing the bigger picture, how to stimulate digital transformation from a policy point of view. A few years ago, we came up with a vision note that sets the main directions we want to explore. In the meantime, we split up this broad term of digital transformation in different components to make it understandable for the cultural sector, what we were talking about and what we would expect from them. So we made a distinction between different uh, elements like digital infrastructure, which is about soft and hardware, digital content, which is about data and data driven approaches, digital innovation and digital expertise, of which we thought that um, it would be a game changer for the digital transformation of the cultural sector. In terms of stimulating digital expertise, we started off with this idea of a chief digital officer, a person that is on the same level as a CEO and is in charge of an institution um, related to all things digital. Decisions on the digital should be dealt with on a high managerial level because it implicates the whole organization. But soon we found out that institutions, especially cultural institutions in Flanders, are way too small to create this extra function. So we decided to look at the tasks and the things that are related to a CDO in terms to cooperate that in institutions. We sent out a tender. What did we ask for? Firstly, we wanted to create a first generation of digital ambassadors, a coherent group of people that would inspire other institutions, that would inspire the broader cultural sectors. Secondly, we thought it was wise to have a balance between a generic approach towards digital transformation and a cultural focus. Um, and we also wanted to have this balance in the consortium that would apply for the tender. We were looking for an active involvement of participants, so we wanted all participants to have their own project within this course uh, so that they would have like a proof of concept that they could apply in their own working situation afterwards. And we thought it was wise to have the selection process as part of the tender tool, because the selection process could provide information um, that could be taken up in the program of this uh, course. We sent out a tender and received some applications. We selected the one that was submitted by Culture Connect, a cultural organization that is mainly working on digital culture. They introduced their proposal together with the universities of Antwerp and Ghent, who have academic expertise in the field of digital transformation, as well as ex extensive experience with leadership and coaching trajectories in the cultural sector. MIMO and Public are also on board, there are cultural institutions that are focusing on digital transformation um, and they also take part in uh, providing parts of the program. And uh, there's also Next Learning Valley who provided the learning uh, platform for the participants. And the first iteration of the course is taking place during the current academic year. The proposal that has been brought forward by the consortium is based on some principles. First of all, the multiplicator effect. We want to stimulate the broader cultural sector with this course. The role of the ambassadors uh, that I already explained is part of that. But we also want to create digital content that will be available for a broader uh, audience and some courses are also open to be attended by non-participants. Sustainability is a specific issue and we are looking for concrete results, things that can be applied in current working situations to move things forward. Um, it also has to do with the sustainability of the digital material that has been provided online and also with the follow-up of the scores, of course. A uh, holistic approach is crucial. A digital transformation involves a lot of elements. It has to do with organizations, with ethical issues, with technical issues, and so far. Um, it should be by and for the cultural sector. So we should actively look at good examples in the cultural sector in Flanders and outside and bring them forward um, to work on. There's also an element of community building um, so informal learning 
is a big part of this course. Uh, the learning platform is a crucial element in this. There's an element of peer support. Um, there's collaboration. Uh, it's about strengthening the professional networks. And last but not least, uh, the principle of customization is uh, important too. So the program will be aligned with the expectations of the participants. And um, there's an element of individual coaching to get um, all institutions that are participating uh, on board. The selection of participants. We were aiming for a specific profile, uh, which has to do with the management level. And we want people that are able to speak for their organizations that are in charge of resources, that are in charge of HR and so on, uh, to make the difference. Um, we were looking for professionals that were working in the cultural sector, not individuals, but the organization itself. And we were looking for early adopters. So not innovators, but early adopters. As the application um, concerns, we wanted to have a clear commitment in time and registration fee. There was a registration fee which was aligned with the, the number of full-time equivalents working in an institution. Um, and we also asked the uh, participants to reflect on uh, what would benefit their own institutions in terms of digital strategy. And we also asked them to fulfill a self-assessment tool on digital maturity to have a clear view of where they are standing uh, on the moment that they subscribed with the digital transformation. And as a result of the selection, we came up with a group of 26 participants, uh, small and bigger institutions within the cultural sector. And it was a good mix uh, of, of different fields like heritage, theater, music, visual and audiovisual arts, uh, and so forth. These quotes are taken from the applications of, the, of some participants. Uh, and they clearly show what their expectations or their learning goals were. Um, this one, for instance, is about, okay, we still have a long way to go in formulating a vision and managing digital processes. Um, this one shows like, okay, we're having a lot of projects on the digital, but how do they relate and how can we grow? So it's about uh, the data idea, it's about CRM systems, it's about online ticketing, it's about digital collections. How, how do they relate? How can we move forward? And this last one, is uh, about the broader context about the necessary competences, the new business models that, that should be taken uh, up, new technologies, what would they offer, and so far. I briefly want to introduce this self-assessment tool for digital maturity, which was part of the, the selection process. Uh, this tool is developed as part of our strategy and it allows five different angles on digital maturity. There's the policy angle, there's one on interaction with target groups, there's one on the offer, there's one on organization and competences, and there is one on processes. What are the building blocks of our course? On the one hand, there are master classes that are meant to strengthen competences and expertise. Um, and expertise is necessarily on a variety of levels, like strategic, business, technical, methodological, human resources. And as an outcome of these master classes, um, we want to have a clear context of digital transformation. We want to translate new developments into possible impact on cultural practice. And we want to focus on the business and management process of digital projects. And the second building block are bootcamp, um, which are meant to develop a digital strategy. The participants are provided with a framework by drawing up a digital strategy for their own organization or partnership. And the bootcamp results in an individual assignment that the participants must submit at the end of the process. So it's about applying what they learned in the master classes in their own context. Um, and this bootcamp is supported by individuals. Something on the required time investment, which is also something we asked uh, at the selection itself. Um, just a brief calculation, there's like 10 days uh, should be foreseen for the classroom setups, like in Corona times, it's a bit different, obviously, and other meetings. 
and they should allow some time for the online community so the learning platform and for the individual assignment there should be five days that they could work independently uh, and um, with as a last element i want to go through the timeline to give an idea of how it's constructed uh, so it starts off with four master classes. This one about the impact of technology and digitization on every aspect of cultural practice. What do new technologies mean for the cultural sector? This one about the relevance of your own organization and ways of working in digital times. What does this mean for leadership and competences? This one about ecosystems, about the digital landscape and the place of cultural organizations in it. What does this mean for interaction? And there's one on business models, about the impact of digital transformation on the business model of companies and organizations. How does your cultural organization respond to this? Um, as a second building block, there's the boot camp on the digital strategy in which the master classes are translated further into local practice and where the participants work with coaches uh, to create their own digital strategy for their own working situation. But currently we are looking on how we can perhaps redesign the bootcamp in an online context. Um, so the, the timing that's been given here is, is tentative, but I think the main idea here is that there's a part of theory and there's a broad part of like practice in which theory can be uh, applied. And we really uh, want the participants to have their own projects ready at the end of this course. So more information can be found on this website, which is in Dutch only, I'm afraid. And there's some context information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Very interesting presentation. And I think I have uh, one question for each of you. And I will start with Jan. Well, Jan, you were, you, you were very, very clear in pointing out how Northern Scotland is a largely rural region. And uh, this is something that is particularly interesting if taken into the context of the broader narrative that was prevailing before the Corona crisis, a narrative in which uh, basically most of what was really interesting and exciting in the culture and creative sectors was happening in cities and possibly in very big cities, in global cities. Now we have this uh, new scenario in which for a variety of reasons, there is an increasing interest in relatively marginal and rural areas. Do you think that this uh, change of scenario will uh, make a difference in terms of a future strategy for creative promotion for the Highlands and more generally for North Scotland? Because as you, as you said in your presentation, we are all also witnessing not only a um, reversal of this narrative regarding uh, the aspect of production that could be to some extent understood, but even for promotion, the fact that uh, there can be an effective promotion exploiting exactly this uh, relatively marginal geographical uh, role, but also highly peculiar uh, with a strong local identity could make a difference maybe with respect to large metropolitan areas, which are big, but in some sense, they are uh, look all the same from certain points of view. What do you think, Jan? <clears throat> I absolutely agree with you, Pierluigi. I mean, what, what we're, we're finding is that there is a, a greater demand from, from consumers around storytelling, about provenance, about experiences. We're also finding that um, people are aware of what London or New York or Berlin is like. You see it constantly on TV. There's always stuff going on there. We're very aware of it. Um, and there's also some, um, images and perceptions of locations like the Highlands and Islands that people have picked up on and may be correct, may not be correct, but there's, a, there's a, a level of interest there that can be built on. And I think that the real opportunity for, for ourselves and for the, with the creative sector is that this is the chance to drive that in interest, drive that enthusiasm and create the experiences and the opportunity for engagement to a much wider audience. And that then creates the opportunity for other business sectors to sell on the back of it. You can, you can make use of it. Um, we, we, for example, been working with a digital health group um, company who've set up an, uh, an online networking event. It's international, there's a lot of stuff there. But one of the things that they've found has been really successful and has, been, has helped them was that we've been supplying musicians and um, people to come in and 
talk about stuff and just provide music, things that relate to the area. And that's made their offering completely unique. It's different to what's being offered somewhere else. And I think um, for me, where I would love to see us end up is that if you look at something like so a, a, a geography like Scandinavia, where the impact on so many parts of our lives with Huga coming coming out, and then you've got the Scandinoir, you've got um, design and, and things coming through. There's all these elements that people pick up on. And why should we not be like this? We have a similar region to many parts of Scandinavia. We have um, a strength of background and story and ideas and images that people can play with. And I think that should be our goal is to impact on it, lifestyle completely, not just individual products. Do you think that this could uh, stretch out also to goals of uh, attraction, for example, of creative professionals from abroad or more generally of residents that are interested in future residents that can be interested in to tap into the vitality of this uh, relatively geographically marginal but extremely strong from the identity point of view uh, territories like uh, Northern Scotland? What do you think? Yes, absolutely it can. The, um, if, if you look at it, first of all, the, the pandemic has started that process with people realising that it's not so much work from home as work from anywhere. And that perhaps being in a, a nice location with plenty of open space is better than being in the city. But when you add to it, what are the things that you're, you're looking for um, you know, if, to, to, to have the business? One is your internet connection. You need good, uh, good connectivity and we have that now. Um, you're looking for skilled workforce potentially. Well, as we see the, the university engaging more with projects like our own and making sure that the students are really are work ready along with their academic knowledge and skills, that, that starts to address those ones. And the third one is about having um, people with common ideas and interests that you can share with and share experiences with and things. And okay, that might not always be a physical connection, but those connections are there. And we do have the, 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 the mass of numbers now, the critical mass to be able to, to, to back that up. Thank you very much, Ayn. And uh, now coming to Hans, uh, you, you, were, um, you, you made a remark that, um, that uh, kept my attention about uh, the resistance, the mental resistance, for example, of museums in accommodating this digital transformation. What do you think are the reasons for this kind of attitude? And are you optimistic about the fact that programs like this can really shift the balance towards a much more proactive digital attitude in the future for museums and cultural institutions alike? What do you think, Hans? Oh. There must be some... Uh, Hans, are you connected? Yeah, I think oh, uh, this should work better. Uh, I think there is uh, a general threat like, uh, okay, how how can we make money if we have to give away our digital assets, which was has been there for a long time. I think over time, the, the idea of open data and the benefits of open data are becoming better and becoming more clear. And I hope we get to the point that actually the idea of making money is not related to the benefit or to the assets itself, but to the services that are shared. So that should be a way forward. And I see some progress and I hope that programs um, such as, as this one, the one that I uh, went into, are actually uh, helping that, that uh, situation to become better. Uh on the other hand, just uh, in nearby Netherlands, there are examples like the Rijksmuseum that have been very bold in terms of uh, freely disseminating and even invited people to, to freely mix up any kind of uh, personal contents uh, with the digital collection from the museum. Uh, why this kind of attitude from the Netherlands has so far not uh, been rooted also into the attitude of, uh, of Flemish museums? Do you think there is a, let's say, some uh, cultural difference or just a difference of vision? What's your take on this? I think the main difference is the size of the institution. Uh, okay. Well, in my regard, I think the Rijksmuseum has a lot of money to experiment and to, it's part of their promotional attitude, but it works well and it's a good example. But if you like compare it to smaller institutions, you have a completely different uh, atmosphere. So you need ex good examples also on that, uh, on that level. 
So you think it's also a problem of the museum boards that are pressing the organization in terms of becoming more financially sustainable in the end? Is this the problem? Well, I think we're moving away from that. I think the open data idea is getting like better and better. Uh, people start believing in that, um, but it takes time. Yeah, sure. But I, and also I imagine that's a problem of uh, more generally of, of the social context of the Flemish society. You, you know, in Europe, of course, there are very different levels today of digital literacy and digital readiness. What is your impression of uh, the state of the artist from this point of view in Flemish society? And more generally, what do you think about uh, Europe's attempts to, to catch up with what's happening at the global uh, level where Europe at the moment is not an innovation leader in this regard? Are you optimistic about the capacity of Europe to cope with these challenges or not? Well, that, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not completely convinced. Uh, so my answer would be like somewhere in the middle. I think everybody feels the urge to do something, especially uh, in what we have been experiencing the last 10, 11 months. So something needs to be done. I think that message became clear. And well, Europe is providing a lot of funding to, to actively work on that currently. So let's hope that this is actually uh, you know, creating um, some, some funding and, and some, some things to be done. So I tend to be optimistic. Okay, that, that's reassuring. And uh, I final question, a final question for both of you. Let's imagine for a moment that I give you a magic wand that unfortunately only works once. If there is something that you can change about uh, the context you are struggling with at the moment, what would be the one in which you would use this magic wand? I mean, uh, what, what kind of change could make uh, your uh, life much better in terms of pursuing your objectives? And Hans, I'll start from you and then go back to Jan. Mm, that's a difficult one. Um, I would say, um, it's, it's kind of a conceptual one. I think if the cultural sector starts thinking as, as a whole, as an ecosystem where things get divided, not divided, but like there's a strong collaboration uh, on many levels, I think that would work. And then you could start creating like outside um, relations as well and operationalize them. So that would be my point. Well, a very good use of a magic wand. I totally agree. That's, that's a smart one. And Jan, what's your take? <clears throat> well, I, partic I like what Hans has just said. That would be a, a good choice. But to go for something different, I think it would be to um, to ensure there was a, 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 a greater opportunity to put in place long-term strategic plans rather than being tied to short um, burst programs. I mean, it could be three years even, but it's still not a long time to make a complete change of uh, cultural approaches and the way that people address things. So it seems from both of you, and that's really interesting to hear, that the big block at the moment is more about mentality, behavior, and perceptions than infrastructures or money. So that's interesting to hear because uh, it really means that uh, this is something difficult, but also at the same time, something that is within reach of cultural action, because in the end, cultural action is about changing attitudes. So I think that, uh, well, we can be reasonably optimistic that this is something can be pursued even without a magic wand. So thank you for, thank you both for this uh, really, really inspiring uh, set of presentations. And now I'll uh, be happy to give the floor to an interview by Amy Show, the co-manager of BCTU Vision in Scotland, She's interviewing Michael Wilson, co-producer of Outlander, which is a innovative training program on skills as a factor in investment attraction. So Amy, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pierluigi. And thank you also to the previous speaker. It's been really interesting to hear what you've had to say so far. Um, my name is Amy Shaw. I am the co-manager of BEC2 Vision. We are the Scotland-based training arm of BEC2 The Union, which supports freelance TV practitioners across the UK. Um, we provide a range of training opportunities for people trying to access the industry, for existing practitioners to do their professional development and also producers. And we deliver that through a range of short courses and also longer term programmes. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Wilson, who is the producer of Outlander. Hello, Michael. Hi, everyone. It's really great to have you here with us today. Um, for those of us who haven't seen Outlander yet, could you give us a little bit of an overview about what the series is? 
Uh, certainly, yes. Um, it's a, a high-end television programme, as we call it, which means we're at the slightly bigger budget end. Uh, it's, uh, it's an American commissioned programme. So uh, a, a broadcaster in the States called Stars uh, are the main commissioner of it. Uh, the studio behind the show is Sony Pictures. Uh, th this story follows a, a time-travelling nurse uh, who, in 1945, is thrown back in time and she finds herself in Jacobean, Scotland, uh, part of the Jacobean uprising, uh, rather, uh, in Scotland. And we follow them through, well, we're, we're, we're in our sixth season now, uh, but we follow them on their adventures as they cross back and forth across different time periods. Uh, it's an action adventure uh, love story. It's adapted from the books by Diana Gabaldon. Uh, and as I say, we're in our sixth season. Uh, so it's proved to be uh, a show that people keep coming back to. And Outlander um, is one of the first high-end television programme series that's been established in Scotland and it's kind of changed the landscape of television production in Scotland. Um, you've been there since the very start of it. Can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of the production in Scotland? Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I guess my own experience uh, probably reflects what a lot of people's experience was, which was prior to Outlander. Um, what happened in Scotland was we tended to make kind of UK broadcast dramas, things like Taggart and Inspector Rebus were shows that I'd worked on, Monarch of the Glen. Those kind of shows uh, are much smaller in scale. Uh, they don't quite work on the same industrial level that we do. So we would have a crew on, on something like Taggart or Rebus of 60 or 70 people. Whereas on a show like Outlander, we have a crew which varies from maybe 300 as a base number up to four or 500 people, sometimes depending what we're filming. Uh, and as I say, it operates on an industrial scale. So we have a large facility, we have workshops, uh, construction, uh, prop making, uh, costume making. Uh, so there's a range of different talents and skills which are involved in a show like this. It's not just about camera, sound, acting and production and locations and logistics. As I say, we actually manufacture uh, a lot of stuff here uh, and the craft uh, that comes out of our costume, particularly in construction departments and our prop making departments, uh, the, these are skilled craftsmen. Um, so we didn't really have a skills base for that kind of work in Scotland before. Uh, it tended to be that people who were practitioners of those kind of things would move to London because uh, most of the big scale industrial operations that happened in the UK would have worked out of Pinewood or Shepparton or places like that. So by uh, building a film studio in Scotland, which we did, I mean, we essentially converted a an empty industrial building. Uh, and we now have five sound stages uh, and a large expanse of construction workshops. Um, we, uh, we've built Scotland's first film studio as, as a side project to making Outlander because there wasn't a facility here for us to use. It's amazing. It's amazing to see what's involved um, since you guys kind of took place there. And the Outlander training program has kind of become part of the legacy of Outlander, I think, really. Um, how did it, how was it decided to bring a training program into the program and how did it all start? I think, I mean, <clears throat> in season one, as I say, these skills didn't really exist in Scotland. Uh, there were people who did make costumes, uh, but they were maybe working for Scottish Opera or they were working out of, uh, as I say, working out of facilities down in London. So we tried to draw as many uh, Indigenous talent into the show as we could, but inevitably there were huge gaps for us to fill. Uh, and across the first couple of seasons, we had to import a lot of talent uh, from London, from Ireland. We even brought in, you know, line technicians from, uh, from the Czech Republic at one point. Uh, it was a struggle to fill the skills gaps that we we had in Scotland. Uh, so training was uh, on the agenda from very, very early on. We were actually quite lucky because uh, in the UK at that time, I can't remember, I think it might have been the um, Conservative Liberal uh, Coalition government had actually pumped a significant amount of money into Skillset, who are the skills agency which cover our sector. Uh, and they were running a scheme called Trainee Finder at the time. Um, and trainee finders seem to have at that moment, and it was only for a very short moment, they seem to have a reasonably bottomless budget. Uh, so we said, give us trainees, give us trainees. Uh, and I think across that first season, we had more trainees than we've had on any subsequent season because of funding. I think we had something like 30 trainees through the door. Uh, um, and most of them were 
uh, all match funded. Outlander would pay kind of half the cost of them and skill set would pay the other half cost. Um, but as we moved into our second season, we had far from solved the problems of skills shortages in Scotland and all of that funding disappeared. Um, and skill set suddenly came back and said, we've, we've got a, a a, a tiny percentage of what we gave you in season one that we can give you towards your training budget. Uh, so we were very lucky because Creative Scotland uh, were able to step in and help meet some of that funding. Uh, so the way the scheme is structured at the moment, I think Creative Scotland pay maybe about 40% of the overall funding, uh, skill set contribute uh, maybe 6 or 7% of the funding and Outlander uh, fund the rest of it. And how do you kind of decide what roles to recruit from? You've talked about the fact that there was so many skill shortages in Scotland, you know, when you started and you had a lot of trainees. How do you go about each year? How do you decide what trainees you're going to bring in for that season? How do you identify the skills gaps? And um, the film and television industry is very departmentalised, as I've sort of touched on before. So you've got your construction and your props department, your costume makeup department, uh, and each one of those departments has a, a hierarchy of control, an HOD and a supervisor. Uh, and I guess we respond when it comes to the training uh, scheme. We, we kind of respond to the ones that are shouting the loudest. So, um, you know, who, who's got the most need? Uh, and obviously, the larger departments sometimes benefit from more trainees. But with the larger departments, construction department, for example, has within it uh, carpentry, painting, plastering. Um, uh, and the costume department has a range of different departments as well. They've got, you know, the set, the floor, they've got dye and breakdown, they've got costume making, embroidery, uh, design. So that there's a range of sub departments there as well. So we, we try and cater as much as we can for all of the requests. And, and, and to be frank, we, we don't provide as many trainees as our teams would like. Everybody's always asking. Um, the flow of... Uh, the, the flow of employment in this industry is everybody kind of starts as a trainee, as a junior in a department, and they learn the craft. And we do talk about craft um, being a feature of, of every department in film and television. It, it's, it's an unusual industry, and you can't learn it at university. I mean, you can start to learn the basics of it at university, but really it's on-the-job training that we all, I mean, Amy, you know yourself, you've worked in the industry for many years as well. You start off making tea for people and photocopying scripts, and then over the years, you 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 get uh, you know you in, increase your uh, responsibilities and you get trusted with more responsibilities. Um, but yeah, we we've we across the course of the the six seasons that we've done now, we've had a huge range of uh, trainees in every department. I think, and and generally we respond to the business needs of people saying this year it's really difficult to find lighting technicians, or this year it's really difficult to find people for the greens department, um, and we'll concentrate our resources um, in in those departments. Yeah, as you say, I mean, on-the-job training is really key to working in the film and TV industry and it's to move forward, which is why it's so fantastic that Outlander has this training programme, because it provides that opportunity to people that can sometimes be quite difficult to access. With regards to that, um, what, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the recruitment for the programme? Is it open recruitment? Can anyone apply? How does that kind of work? Uh, there are eligibility criteria, so we ask that people can prove that they've got a track record of trying to gain employment in the industry. Uh, usually they've had a little bit of work experience. As you can imagine, the competition for roles is, is enormous. Uh, so usually they've got a little bit of experience, but we don't want anyone who's got more than, say, a year's experience of working in the industry. We are a high-end job, so the kind of, I suppose, the the standard that we command needs to be of a certain level. So people who've literally just walked off a media course um, are probably a bit too green for us, let me say, and we prefer to have someone who's got a sense of how the industry works before they come in. Um, we advertise on local channels, you know, Creative Scotland's website, Skillset's website, uh, and social media. I mean, you know what it's like these days. You put a mail shot out with a picture of our star actors on it saying that you're looking for trainees, and it goes viral. Uh, I think last year, we I'm not sure the numbers for this year, but last year we had 6,500 uh, applicants for 20 roles. Um, so there's a huge amount of demand. Everybody wants to get involved in it uh, and a huge amount of competition for those positions. One of our eligibility criteria is that you must uh, live in Scotland and um, that you must. What, what we've always said is this is not about 
uh, bringing people in from London or Manchester. This is about growing our indigenous industry. So we insist that people must have an address uh, in Scotland and, and, uh, and that's proved to be successful because a lot of the people we have trained up have stayed. We lose the odd one and we're always disappointed when somebody's headhunted and they go off to live in London and a lot of people in their you know mid-20s the kind of uh, age bracket that we're recruiting uh, it's the excitement of going off down to work at Pinewood on Star Wars or something like that is hard to compete with so we do lose a few but many of them stay. Brilliant. And what's the experience like for a trainee on the training programme? Are they on for the whole production and what kind of opportunities do they get when they're on board? Yeah, it, it varies. Most of the departments um, consider that the, the longer the placement, the better and, and the further they can take them on and the more likely they are to be able to, to take on employment after that. Some departments have got, you know, it comes down to they, they find two incredible candidates so they say we're going to split the placement and we're going to over the course of the eight or nine months that it takes to shoot the film the show and um, we're going to have two different trainees or maybe even three trainees across the course of the season and um, but many departments will have one person uh, and they'll bring them in and they'll do eight or nine months uh, they get complementary to the on the on the job training uh, each one of them will do a tailored training plan so they'll sit down with someone who they're working closely with if they're working in the costume department uh, they might say by the end of my placement I need to learn how to use the embroidery machine the button punching machine the you know uh, forgive me because I don't know the science of it all but uh, they will set out a range of things that they want to have experience of and hopefully have um, ticked off as something that they now know and and, and the idea behind that is that they can then specialize and they can then go okay I'm going to go down that route um, and, and pick a particular specialism. And do they get the opportunity these people that are coming in might have a little bit of experience but um, they'll be coming in reasonably new to the industry they get a chance to kind of learn about more the industry overall and other roles that are involved and how it's a collaborative existence do they find out more about that yeah we do we we uh we run a, a course at the beginning of the placements which gives them a kind of overview of the industry and how the different departments come together uh, as part of induction training um, and then through the course of the traineeships we run a thing called the shadowing uh, program so each trainee will be able to pick a, another department they're interested in so if you're the the plastering trainee you might say you quite like to go and work in prop makes or you quite like to go to post-production and see what an editor does or you'd like to go and spend a day in SFX or and um, so yeah we try and give them all an opportunity to pick at least one other department that they're interested in and whether they like it or not we insist that they all have to come and work in my department which is the production department because uh, the production department has an overview of all of those departments uh, it's where kind of things come together it's a sort of central hub so they will all get experience working within our department as well and then complementary to that uh, they also do short courses so we run health and safety training for them uh, and we sometimes run specialized training courses if there's a there are some really good uh, courses most of which come out of you know the national film school or uh, there's a couple of other training providers down in london uh, and if we see them running something that one of our trainees is particularly interested in then we'll sometimes send them off on a short course as well cpd um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, and do you face, I mean, you kind of touched on it earlier on about the funding and the differences in funding between season one and season two and having to kind of start again. Are there any other challenges of kind of running a training programme within an existing production that's got all the stresses and pressures that it has, you know, just running the production itself? The challenges? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think time, you know, time to spend with the trainees and actually carve out uh, time to give them the pastoral care that they need. Um, and so we appointed, I think it was season two, we brought in our first training manager. Uh, and that's been an absolute pivotal role here because most of the the crew are very busy, you know, meeting our business needs and they've got a huge number of duties to undertake. So we thought having an independent person who's specifically geared towards looking after the trainees and protecting those trainees and making sure that they're not just stuck in a corner uh, photocopying scripts, but that they get a range of responsibilities and experiences and that their training plans are followed through on um, that, that and that they just have someone to feed back to if they're feeling stressed or worried about anything. Um, so that training manager position has been absolutely pivotal for us. Um, and I think it's a key part of the training scheme. I think it is a stressful industry to work in because particularly when you're when you're new to it, 
you've got no idea what the expectation is and, and often people don't have time to sit down with you and really tell you what the expectation is so there's a lot of there's a lot going on in the back for these trainees and, and, and it's nice to have an outlet to be able to talk to someone about uh, what's going on in the background yeah absolutely it's fantastic the kind of structure of it is really strong um, and can you tell us a little bit, you touched on earlier on about how occasionally you lose people who go to London and things like that, but of the majority of the trainees that have come on the legacy of the alumni, do they all continue to work in the industry? Do they stick with Outlander? Do they go to other productions? How do you kind of see it happening from the alumni? That you so far? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the vast majority, I think we're up at something like 140 uh, people that have been through the scheme on long placements and that, that uh, there are many, many others have had work experience through the scheme and, and benefited through the scheme. But I think about 140 people have had extended placements uh, and, and the majority of those people have stayed in the industry. You're always going to get some dropout. Uh, so I, I think it's a very small percentage, but some people, of course, choose to do other things. This industry isn't for everyone and many people will come and spend a few years working in film and TV and then decide the hours are too painful or uh, the, the inconsistency with work and the freelance lifestyle of never knowing where your next paycheck's coming from uh, often chases people away from the industry. But the vast majority have continued to work in the industry and many of them have then later been offered employment opportunities at Outlander. So there are people here um, working with us. I mean, uh, we've had you know construction trainees that came on in season one with no qualifications. We've put them through their entire college qualification so they're now, you know, fully qualified plasterers, carpenters, uh, and, and are becoming, moving up through the ranks here and going from being a kind of mid-level or a junior carpenter up to a, a senior craft level. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the opportunities here to grow because season after season we're coming back are fantastic. Uh, uh, you know, very, very lucky to have a returning series. You couldn't really do this in a feature film environment because you've only got that one short period of time to do it. Um, so we've been lucky with that and many of them have developed into good um, skillful uh, operators who've been employed with us and with many other jobs in Scotland. And just to kind of summarise, why do you think it's so important that we make sure that work-based learning happens in film and TV production? You know, we've talked about it being a freelance industry and that it can sometimes be a struggle for people to get in. Do you think the value of it is just so important to have that work-based learning opportunity available to people. Yeah. I don't think there's any other way to learn. And I think, um, I, I, you know, as I say, that's how we all came up through the industry was um, learning on the job. I do think what we've done by bringing in these, you know, the, the training manager is an absolute key part of it. Uh, and these uh, complementary CPD courses that they do as well are really important developments. I think we have seen training schemes, you know, run nationwide in the UK that haven't always had those additional ingredients. And, and I think they, they can sometimes fall down on, on that because uh, those extra things are really important. It's important to take, as I say, to take the, the, the trainees out of the workplace every now and then and say, here's what everybody else is thinking about. Here's what a first assistant director does. Here's what the producer's concerns are. I never got told that when I was coming up. I, I learned on the job. I was never on a formal training scheme. But I'd say the first five to 10 years of my career, I didn't really have the overview. I didn't really understand what that guy's job was over there or what that guy's job was over there. And I think the approach that we've taken to, to the trainees and giving them the induction day and giving them that overview, uh, gives them a bit of a head start on, on what I had when I came into the industry. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to run the training programme and continue it and make sure that it continues. And I hope that it does for many more seasons of Outlander to come. And thank you so much for taking the time today to join us. I know you're on set and I know you're facing snow and scheduling challenges and all sorts of things. So thank you very much. No for, being, um, and I'll, for having me. I'll hand back over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Amy and Michael. And if I have some, some extra time from Michael, just a couple of minutes to ask a, a question I was very curious about. You you spoke about the skills shortage in the in the local industry. At the, at the same time, now we we know that the 
television series uh, is probably one of the booming uh, content markets at the global level. And uh, from this point of view, clearly Europe has a bunch of successful examples, but not really globally successful examples. If I think of countries like South Korea or now Turkey, of course, they are really booming at the global level. Do you think that the, 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 the capacity of uh, the European countries to compete on this ground is in this, this moment uh, hampered by, for example, this uh, kind of skills, skills shortage or are there other factors that we have to, to keep up with to be, to be able to really compete at the global level? Uh, I think in a huge way, it comes down to what production incentives are there <clears throat> where, um, the countries that really boom in Europe are the Czech Republic and Hungary, particularly, and it's because they have very good tax breaks. Their government have played cleverly and they've made sure they can attract the American money. And the American money is everything. You know, it's we all know it. it's Netflix, it's Amazon, it's HBO, it's Apple, it's Disney. Those are the big ones. Those are the guys who are making TV at an industrial level. And the reason that Britain has seen this incredible growth and, and Outlander kind of has lived the life of that. I think the, the tax rebate in the UK came in um, pretty much on, on you know, on, on the same moment as we, we started off this show we benefited it from it game of thrones benefited from it in ireland and transformed the irish uh, film community in the same way that outlander has transformed the scottish film community and there's been an absolute glut of uh, production uh, down south in london in manchester and all over the uk and it is because of that government incentive so i think if other european countries want to to catch up that's what they've got to do. I mean, the, the and whether and it's a controversial policy because you know what what these companies are getting 20, uh, 20 to twenty five percent back on the dollar uh, for every every dollar that they invest in this country, which is a significant uh, comeback. But Britain wouldn't have a, a film and TV sector without it. They would simply go somewhere else. It's a global industry. You can pretend when you're in Hungary that you're in Scotland. You can pretend when you're in the south of Ireland that you're in Scotland, as they did on Braveheart. You know, it's really a cheat. It's easy to do. It's smoke and mirrors. That's what our business is. Outlander at the moment, the last two seasons have been set in North Carolina. And the audience don't pick it up, but we're shooting it in Scotland. We're shooting it in the centre of Scotland and we're pretending we're in North America. And um, so, you, you know, that, that's the nature of our industry. The money will go where the money is uh, best spent. And uh, if you want to attract uh, film and television at an industrial scale, then you've got to provide the right government incentives. Thank you very much, Michael. That was really insightful. Thanks for that. And now we move on to another case study, which in this case is a European project. So the T-Factor Horizon 2020 project. And uh, I am pleased to give the floor to Laura Martelloni from uh, Anci Toscana to, to, to present us this project that is uh, on capacity building for culture-led urban regeneration. Laura, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Sacco, and also thanks to OSCD and European Commission for a kind invitation today. So I, I think I'm the last in the panel and really hope that my, let's say, story and contribution might be relevant to the discussion that we are having today. So I will go quickly through this project, which is an Horizon 2020 project that recently started. It only started in June last year and is indeed one between many others projects that are actually showing the massive investment that the European Commission is making in order to enhance the role that arts and culture and creativity may have in regenerating cities across Europe for the better. Uh, so next slides, please. So in order to explain a bit what T-Factor is all about, I need to make a bit of step back and start from the problem that here we are facing, which we call sort of paradox of urban regeneration, which essentially describes the fact that, yes, we do regenerate cities, of course, for clear objectives of renovation, reactivation, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but often we run the risk to actually lead to further abandonment, further decay and dynamics of displacement. And the reason why um, this happens, of course, are many. And here, if you want, I'm a bit generalizing. But still, we tend to see urban regeneration really happening in a sort of top-down way 
we still go through short term, let's say, political cycles that, of course, do not help to go for broader and longer term uh, ambitions and goals. We have a massive issues with rigid and deterministic master plans that almost leave zero space to make changes or adjustments while we go and we deliver sites. Importantly, we often tend to focus a lot on regenerating the physical infrastructures while we tend to forget that regenerating, let's say, social bonds, cultural assets, economic dimension is probably even most important. And I would say there is this keyword gentrification that is more and more mainstreaming, you know, the debate about urban regeneration. And it's quite curious because uh, we tend to look at it as a sort of effect of urban regeneration without really understanding many times that especially arts and cultural gentrification is a sort of key ingredient of business models in real estate development. So it's not a case that they are there. And last but not least, as we are seeing right now with the pandemic, we have, of course, a huge issue when we still keep a boundary, straight boundary between what is public and what is uh, pri private value. So if this is the situation, do we have a plan B, let's say? Uh, next, please. So um, T factor is all about meanwhile spaces or temporary uses in city. Maybe this term is more intuitive and familiar. And the way we are looking at meanwhile uh, in this project is really about the period of time that stands in between uh, the moment where a master plan is designed, is delivered, is approved, and years or decades later, the, the, the actual delivery of the regenerated sites. And what we are assuming in this project is that this period, which is increasingly long, increasingly complex, can be a strategic period of time that we can use essentially to raise, let's say, regeneration ambitions, to raise quality, to raise value, and basically impact for all. Uh, next, please. So um, certainly temporary uses are not new in Europe. I mean, we, uh, we know, for example, Berlin or Paris or London being really pioneers in this field, but probably what we can generally observe is the fact that they all, um, often tend to be limited to sort of marketing operations on the one hand, or at best to be activation levers in the meanwhile. So what we would like to somehow test throughout this project and demonstrate is that there is a frontier probably that is still there to be discovered that most re relate to the role that meanwhile use can play in terms of prototyping future spaces, future functions in cities before we make, let's say, massive financial investment in physical infrastructure. So it's really about using meanwhile spaces to, um, to make collective uh, social innovations that attempt to respond to both present and future needs. And when it comes to arts, culture, and creativity, they, of course, play a fundamental role, not only because they will somehow, they will help trigger participatory placemaking, but more than that, because they will help to somehow unlock and push people towards new imaginaries, and most importantly, to have their active say and their hands uh, in designing and testing new ways of living, of moving or caring or, or enjoying in cities. And well, um, indeed, we focus a lot on the software side of urban regeneration. So really about reactivating people and connections and culture and so on and so forth. But I guess we are also aware that if you're not able to touch upon, the, let's say, the deep codes that stand behind urban regeneration, so say, policy making, governance, regulations, at the end, we are not really changing, uh, so to speak, the algorithm behind it. Um, next one. 
Thank you. So here you can see quickly uh, the different cultural and creative hubs where we are intervening. So the red ones are what we call, let's say, front runner cases. So these are all um, hubs where uh, regeneration initiatives have been more or less finished and all these cases have experimented with meanwhile uses and what we are doing right now is really to research them to understand their methods their their tools and to slowly try to transfer this learning and to re-articulate them across the pilot cities that you can see here in blue and these are all places characterized by early stage regeneration sites, so really at the very beginning, all aiming at becoming cultural and creative hubs, although with, let's say, different connotations of culture and creativity. And our ambitions is basically to test uh, throughout the next few years a massive programs of meanwhile uses with the ambition to really try to improve and raise ambitions and opportunities for impact of already existing master plans. Um, next one, please. So here, uh, maybe you can have a better understanding of the act main activities that we are developing in this project, but I won't go through that detail because my time is really short and I would prefer to share some three key, three key things that we are observing, although consider them as really super preliminary. First one, and probably here, uh, it's a bit risky statement, but let, let's put it like this. We are somehow observing the fact that private investors are somehow changing their uh, minds and, and their attitudes. So they seem, may seem, more and more ready to accept less profit if this comes with better quality. And in that, there is some sort of recognition that indeed arts, culture, and creativity can be fundamental drivers to increase that quality. So in that sense, I think there will be probably increasingly space for arts, culture, and creativity to make a fundamental role in urban regeneration. Second is that these meanwhile spaces uh, are not necessarily managed uh, by, let's say, top down, so real, really by real estate developers, or on the other hand, by grassroots communities. I think we are more and more observing the fact that a whole new bunch of organizations are emerging with new business models, with new positionings. And I would say, personally, the most interesting thing that we are seeing is that there is a whole bunch of new connections and new kind of collaborations that are starting to emerge between, let's say, the hard part of urban regeneration and the soft part. So really seeing that these teams across different cities are often characterized by creative artists, engineers, urban planners, business analysts, they're starting to work together on, let's say, on this topic. So really positioning themselves as new intermediaries between vacant spaces and cities and uh, the whole um, audience of culture and, and creative actors. Um, next one, thank you. So uh, who we are basically a consortium of 25 organizations. And um, if you actually go on our website, you can start to see some maps that we uh, released some few days ago. And curiously, maybe this is something that I would like to share. We started last June and because of COVID, we could never met until now. So imagine how difficult it is uh, to infrastructure such a large scale collaborations where you cannot really meet and sit together and have a real conversation beyond this digital devices. So we developed these maps exactly to help people understand where they are in this big ecosystem and more than that, how we are working together. And I guess that maybe in this audience, there are many people involving, involved in European projects and also struggling with creating new ways in this times of social dis distancing of working um, together. Um, uh, last but not least, we are of course not alone in this journey. Uh, we work closely with other two projects funded under the same call. 
First one is Centrino, led by the city of Milan, who is heavily focused on industrial historical sites and really on making the case for uh, demonstrating how urban production making and digital manufacturing can unlock new enterprises and jobs, as well as new professional knowledge and skills. And the other one is Habin, which is led by Innova. Lisbon, who is instead much focused on historical heritage in cities and how we can really develop new tools and methods to preserve their unique social, cultural and environmental values. So from this map, you can see basically we intervene over 26 cities and 22 countries together, which is indeed great potential, but I would say also great responsibility to make sure that the investment that the Commission is making throughout these three projects really contribute to impactful urban regeneration. And thank you so much for your attention. Laura, thank you very much. I, you mentioned uh, in passing, uh, of course, the, the, the pandemic. And so the, the natural question is, but uh, to what extent the, the pandemic crisis at the moment is influencing the unfolding of a project like yours? And in particular, how the, capa the capacity building part of the project is affected by what's happening now? Well, uh, you know, I think that of course it's a big issue because it's really about meanwhile spaces, so physical spaces that we, we cannot really use right now. So we are in a way already starting to work a lot on alternative ways, digital ways by which we can engage people uh, in let's say consultation, but more than that in imagining these spaces. So I would say there is a great limit, indeed it is, but at the same time, it's somehow unlocking new capacities, certainly. So it's a great way right now to see how uh, universities and cities and grassroots communities are starting to combine their methods and their knowledge to make that possible and more effective. Thank you very much, Laura. So let's see if there is any question from the audience before we are coming to a close because now it's a eight to four. And so, sorry that there may be some limited space for this. I, I don't see at the moment on the chat any, any, any emerging questions. So if there is any, please uh, let me know. Otherwise, uh, I will make a brief uh, recap before uh, giving the floor to my colleague Katia for the final wrap up for this conference. So what, what emerged very clearly, I think, is that the skills uh, issue in Europe for culture and creative sectors is taken very seriously. This is something we can see and also how imaginative and uh, far-fetched the approaches are across different industries, across different sectors, also exploiting very much the local characteristics. And this, I think, is something that, again, testifies for the value added of the cultural diversity of a continent like Europe, the capacity really to leverage on so many different uh, cultural resources in a relatively limited space. I think that um, from this point of view, though, uh, and, and, and uh, a topic that emerged several times during these two days has been the necessity of a stronger integration with the overall economy in Europe. So culture and creative sectors are important, but they have increasingly to become a pillar of the whole socioeconomic organization of Europe. Uh, what's happening now is very much still insular, still uh, related to the specific reality and needs of the culture and creative sectors. And this is less and less probably the priority to make uh, culture and creativity really a driver of a, a future uh, European economy, and especially also in helping uh, Europe to position more strongly on many content markets where we are today, of course, aiming at uh, gaining positions, but still at the moment, not particularly central at the global level. So I think, however, that um, this uh, two days have given us uh, lots of insight and in particular, lots of rooms for thought. So I'm really uh, help, uh, grateful that uh, there was this possibility. And uh, for us at OECD, by the way, this is of course just the starting of this joint reflection with the European Commission on how to make, of course, uh, the most of the insights that came out to, to, to devise future approaches and strategies. 
And now at this point, I'm happy to give the floor back to my colleague Katya Travkina for the final considerations and wrap up. Katya, floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Pierluigi, um, and thank you to the speakers of this session. Um, and um, before we um, close, I really wanted to thank uh, our partners, our hosts uh, for this two days, uh, Skills Scotland and Glasgow City Region. I mean, you, thank you so much for this fantastic uh, lineup of speakers. And it was, I don't know how you, how you did it, but I, I think many of us felt almost as if we were there, almost as if we were in Scotland and Glasgow. So thank you so much. And I'm sure that uh, colleagues from the commission are joining me and, and, and other partner regions as well in this, thanks. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank uh, other partners in our uh, webinar series and in our project, uh, World Cities Culture Forum, ICOM, International Council of Museums, Bureau Cities. Uh, and uh, uh, um, what's next now? Um, Next month, we'll uh, have uh, another webinar, uh, and that is about how to get uh, back into business, the creative firms. So how can we support them uh, through the crisis now and more importantly, through, through the recovery? And uh, this time we'll go from uh, Scotland and we'll be in Flanders. It will be Flanders will be the host of this next webinar. And we'll have a spotlight session. As you saw, we, uh, each time we have a spotlight session on a particular sector. And in Flanders, it will be the book publishing sector, very exciting uh, theme. Uh, then we'll have another webinar on innovation and public and uh, private investment and culture. Uh, and you're also invited to our fourth edition of the Trento Center Summer Academy on Cultural and Creative Industries. So this is the plan for the next uh, months. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers and thank you to our hosts and partners. We hope to see you at the end of February and all the materials, of course, will be published on our website. Thank you so much.